6 verses, John chapter 14, beginning at verse 6, reading through verse 11. And the King James text today reads in this fashion. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Philip saith unto the Lord, excuse me, Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father? and the Father in me. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me. Or else believe me for the very works sake. I want to talk to us for a while today on the topic, to know Him is to love Him. To know Him is to love Him. If you'll bow your heads with me one more time, Master, Savior, Redeemer, King, how we love you, how we appreciate you, how grateful we are for the salvation plan that provides a way not only for us to one day make heaven our home and to one day look upon you and see you as you are. For in that day we will be like you. But Master also that allows us to walk in blessing and in fellowship and in communion with your spirit even in this life. And Lord as the word of God declares it is true. In the presence of the Lord there is fullness of joy. There's something about being in the presence of God. Lord there is something about being where the spirit of the Lord is. That is so wonderful and so gracious and so precious. I have enjoyed this experience since I was a child and now at 58 years of age I still, still, still long to be in your presence. Master, in the name of Jesus, loose the anointing of the Holy Ghost today. Anoint, Master, my feeble lips. They fall so short. They are so incapable of uttering words of divine wisdom and instruction that are able to bless and encourage and help the people of God, especially Lord, when my own spirit is broken and you declare, the word of God declares, a broken spirit, who can bear it? And Master, today I need the anointing if I'm to be a blessing and a help to anyone. Open the ears of every hearer. Help them to receive the word of God today, but not not merely to receive it as words upon their hearing, but let them receive it today, Lord, as, 
apples of gold, the word fitly spoken. Touch every hearer, touch every heart. Lift us up to a new place in you than we have ever before known. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Tommy has a friend that he grew up with. We bumped into him some time ago at a Walmart in Dallas. This was a couple of years ago. He grew up in the same religious organization as Tommy. And bless his heart, he is a person of broken spirit and struggling spiritually and psychologically. He's, he's, uh, my heart bleeds for this young man. But he asked the question, he said, why on earth did God even make us? Why on earth did God even create us? What was his purpose? Because according to the organization that he and Tommy were raised in, basically God created mankind primarily to vex and punish and torment. And I told Tommy's friend, what I'm telling you now, from the very beginning of creation, our God had desired a people who would love Him. He created the angels to serve Him. He created the angels to carry out His will without question. The angels are sometimes in the Word of God called the sons of God. And some people have completely misconstrued and misinterpreted the, that term, that use of the word son. They're not sons at all. They're servants. They're not sons. You and I today who have believed and obeyed the gospel, we are sons and daughters of God. Hallelujah. We have a very different relationship with God even than the angels. The angels envy us. Because God counts us as sons and daughters, as offspring. <clears throat> he brought us into his family through the revelation of the only begotten Son of God. The only man ever born into the human family who had no father on this earth but whose only father was the creator was the spirit of almighty God and he was in the manger begotten and that's why he is called the only begotten son of God he's not an angel not even close. The Apostle Paul asked the question, to which of the angels, at what time did he ever say to any angel, this day I have begotten thee? The very nature of that statement makes it abundantly clear that Paul was asking a rhetorical question, obviously. He was not making a declaration. Oh, he spoke to one of the angels and said, this day I have begotten thee. No. What Paul was saying was, while the angels are called the sons of God, he said, where did he ever, when did he ever say to an angel, oh, this day I have begotten thee? No, the angels were not born, they were created. The only begotten son of God was born 
Hallelujah. He was born into the human family. He was born into flesh and blood. He was born into the existence that you and I know today. And he was born into that existence for a purpose and for a reason. And that reason primarily being so that God could reveal himself to us on terms that we could actually comprehend and we could understand. You see, if I go to England, if I go to London and I go to Buckingham Palace and I'm invited to have an audience with King Charles and I go into his study or into his throne room or wherever he might choose to meet with me. I am meeting with him and I'm seeing him as the king. And there's a certain decorum. There, there's, there are certain manners and certain things that you have to do certain ways when you're in the presence of the monarch. But if King Charles were to get in his car and drive to my house and knock on my door and say, hey, how you doing? I thought I'd come in and have a cup of coffee with you today. Would that be okay? While he is still the king, he would be making himself available to me at a very different level. And he would be able in that setting to act very differently. He would be able in that setting to carry himself very differently. I tell people all the time, even while in California, going there to minister for my beautiful extended church member, Stephanie, whom I love dearly. I've been knowing that girl for several years, baptized her in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ some years back. She made the journey to Texas from California simply to be baptized in the name of the Lord. And she honored me by allowing me to be the man of God who could administer for her that sacred ordinance. Nothing thrills me more than to baptize a believer in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. Nothing, nothing. There is no thrill in this world that gives me a greater sense of joy than the honor of baptizing someone in Jesus' name. But even when I went to California and after we had baptized Brendan and we went to the Denny's across the street from the hotel and uh, we were sitting there at Denny's and let me tell you, we were laughing and we were having a good time. Anybody who knows me, Tommy certainly knows me, knows that I'm a cut up. When I'm not in the pulpit, when I'm sitting somewhere outside of the pulpit, I love to cut up, I love to joke, I love to be lighthearted, I like to be something of a comedian. Yes, when I lived in New York City some years ago, while I was out of church, I even tried my hand to stand up comedy because I love, you know, being the comedian. I love doing that. I love having fun. And I said to Brendan, I said, you're able to see me in a way that is different than most people who watch us online because all they see me online is in the pulpit and, and I don't play in the pulpit. Every once in a while I'll go in a humorous direction while I'm preaching but it's not a whole lot. I tend to be rather serious when I'm preaching. But get me out of the pulpit. Get me into a different environment and you will find real quickly that I come across quite a bit differently than I do in the pulpit. You hear what I'm telling you now? 
from the very beginning of creation. God desired a people who did not serve him by design as the angels do, but who loved him by choice as we today are able to do. In Deuteronomy 6 and 5, the, uh, the Lord spoke, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Jesus was speaking with the Apostle Philip, and Philip asks him, Lord, we could really buy into this Son of God business a little bit better if you could just show us the Father. And Jesus did not say to him, Philip, you don't understand in a human body you would not be able to lay eyes upon the Father. According to the Word of God, the human body is incapable of laying eyes upon the divine. The human body is incapable of laying eyes upon the Creator. Even the Lord Himself told Moses when Moses made such a request. He said, Moses, you couldn't stand it. You couldn't handle it. You couldn't take it. But I'll put you in the cleft of the rock. And I'll hold my hand up before you until I pass through the valley. And once I've passed, I'll pull my hand away. And I'll let you see my back. Oh, hallelujah. God wanted somebody that loved him. But his plan, the whole while, was this. I'm going to ask them to love me. But they're initially going to be seeing me as the grand architect of the universe. They are initially going to see me as the creator. They are initially going to see me as the God of all ages. They're going to see me as the most powerful being that exists in all of the world, in all of the universe. He said, but the day's going to come. Hallelujah. When I'm going to give them the opportunity to see me differently. Oh my God have mercy. The day is going to come when I'm going to give them the opportunity to see me in a more intimate and in a more personal way. The day is going to come when I'm going to allow them to see me on terms that they can understand and they can comprehend. I will manifest myself to them. And he did so in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said to Timothy in his epistle, he said, for without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. But why did he do this? It's easy. Because to know him is to love him. Hallelujah. How many times do you talk to people and they say, well, but the God of the Old Testament was so hard. He was so mean. He was so rough. Mm-hmm. And yet that same God was the baby born in the manger was the same man who sat with the woman at the well and spoke not a single word of condemnation. 
said nothing to her to condemn her for her sin or her failings or her faults. The same man who could have a woman dragged before him who was caught in the very act of adultery and yet he spoke not a word of condemnation but rather he asked those who stood by well I'll tell you what whoever among you is without sin y'all start the stoning and we'll, we'll all follow in right after you and when thank God that crowd, unlike modern fundamentalists, thank God that crowd, the one hypocrite, won in the bunch. I guarantee you, if that had been in the modern era, some jackass would have picked up a stone and started throwing it. Because these fundamentalists and evangelical knuckleheads would think themselves qualified to do so. Jesus said, let him that is without sin cast the first stone. But those who stood that day surrounding that woman recognized, <laughs> I don't qualify. I'm not qualified to pick up a stone. I think I'll just leave now. And when all of her accusers were gone, and she stood alone in front of, listen to me children, the God of all creation. <laughs> he said to her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you, when you see our God in the face the word of God said we see the glory of God in the face of the man Jesus Christ when you see God in Christ you can't help but love him he was compassion filled beyond comparison he possessed empathy that could go to the deepest depths and a love that was greater and higher than any love any man had ever demonstrated in all of human history. Even looking out from a cruel, painful, hideous, device of torture the cross of Calvary and even in that state even in pain and agony even having been turned on by the very people he had never acted once maliciously toward he had healed their sick he had cleansed their lepers. He had raised their dead. He had cast out demons. Just days before they cried out, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And yet days later, stirred up by the religious leadership of their day, Suddenly they were crying, crucify him, crucify him. Oh, but our God hung on that cross. The Apostle Paul said, to wit, God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. Oh, hallelujah. And our God from the cross said, Father, forgive them. <laughs> oh, my God, if that don't make you want to shout, I don't know what does. Oh, hallelujah, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Talk about love. Talk about empathy. Talk about grace. 
grace. Talk about mercy. Oh, honey, to know him is to love him. Jesus sat with Philip that day and said, Philip, <laughs> you want me to show you the Father? I said, Philip, how long have you and I been keeping company? How long have you known me? How long have we been friends? And yet you would still make an asinine request like that of me? I said, Philip, if you knew me, you know that I am the Father. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Say, if you, if you had a clue, you would realize. He said, and furthermore, from this day forward, this is what Jesus said. He said, from this day forward, you can say and you can know that not only do you now know the Father, but you have seen Him. Oh, hallelujah. Philip, I came because I know when people see me in a more casual environment, I know when people see, see when I'm sitting on the throne as God, I, I'm coming from a very different place. I have to act like the creator. I have to act like the sovereign. I have to act like the king of the universe. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Oh, when you see me in the throne room, Philip, I got, I've got to be the king because that's what the king does in the throne room. If the king started acting like a clown and goofing off and, be, and being playful and, and being personal with you in the throne room, people would lose all respect for him. People would lose any reverence for him whatsoever. They would lose all confidence in his ability to lead and to rule, am I telling the truth? He said, but that's the whole reason I came, Philip. <laughs> that's the whole reason I'm here, so that you can say and know, I've seen the Father, glory to God, and I know the Father because the Father has revealed himself to us in the person of a man that we called the Son. The angel said to Mary before the baby was born, he said, you're going to bear a child, it's going to be a boy, and it says, and he shall be called, oh my God, he shall be called the Son of the Highest. Hallelujah. See, we call him the Son because in earthly terms, in fleshly terms, he is the only man ever born of God and God alone. Therefore, we call him the Son of God. But Isaiah declared in prophecy, Isaiah 9 and 6, His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Well, I'm going to tell you something. To know him is to love him. There are a lot of people in our world today who will say to you, I like your Christ. Gandhi said it. He said, I'm fine with your Christ. He said, it's your Christians I have a hard time with. Hello now. Oh, because to know the man Jesus, to read the testimony of his life in the Gospels, you can't help but love him. In John chapter 8, verse 42, Jesus said unto, unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. 
in Romans chapter 5 verses 6 through 8 for when we were yet without strength in due time Christ died for the ungodly for scarcely for a righteous man will one die yet preadventure for a good man some would even dare to die but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us the Apostle Paul was saying to the Romans you know that not very many people have died for a righteous man he said and maybe for a good man there might be some who'd be willing to die for a good man he said but look at what the Lord did hallelujah he said while we were yet sinners Christ died for us. He didn't wait for us to be something pretty. He didn't wait for us to fix ourselves. He didn't wait for us to, to look better and act better and be better. No, 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 no. He died for us when we were still yet at our worst. My God, how in the world can you beat that kind of love? I can't imagine very many human beings today that would be willing to go to their death for the sake of their enemies, for the sake of those who hate them, for the sake of those who curse them, for the sake of those who revile them. But that's exactly what our God did. And that's why today I say to you, to know Him is to love Him. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Listen to me today, children. The Word of God declares that we love Him. Why? Because He first loved us. We don't love God first. You know, there, there's that old saying people will often say when they're testifying of their salvation, well, I found the Lord in such and such a year. Honey, you didn't find nothing. He found you. Glory to God. He's the good shepherd. He's the one that went out looking for the one that was lost, although he had 99 safely in the fold. He's the one that searched for the one that was lost. He's the one that found the one who was bound up in the bristles and in the briars and loosed them and brought them back to the fold of safety and nursed them back to health. You didn't find anything. God found you. We love Him because He first loved us. And oh, I'm going to tell you, the more you know Him, the more you love Him. The biggest problem in the Christian world today, many people don't know who Jesus is. Their church says he's the second person of the divine trinity. Their church tells them that he's the second person in a divine totem pole. But I'm here to tell you today, he is not the second. He is the first and the only glory to God. He declares in the book of Revelation, I am the first and I am the last. Hallelujah. The beginning and the end. There is nobody else in the middle. Glory to God. There's nobody above him and there's nobody exerting that is not beneath him. One day every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Hallelujah. Woo! To know him is to love him. When you understand that that man Jesus is the creator, John, the apostle John wrote in John chapter 1, he was in the world. Oh my God. <laughs> Woo. 
He was in the world. And he created the world. Oh, hallelujah. He was in the world. And he created the world. And the world knew him not. Glory to God. Hallelujah. When you understand that that man we call the Son of God was in fact none other than God, then my friend, you're able to get a much more intimate portrait of our Creator. You're able to get a much better understanding and a much better image of our God. Do you understand me? I told you when I was teaching some weeks ago in our Bible study series on LGBT affirming theology and I was talking about the law. And I was saying the law seems so harsh and so hard and so many people get so caught up in these people were to be stoned and these people were to be killed and we get so caught up in the letter of the law that these same people never stop for a minute to look at the whole of the law. What did God require in order for those rules to be carried out? Basically, he made it virtually impossible for anyone to be killed for anything. He literally made it virtually impossible. So what he did was he built grace in. He built mercy in to the law. So on one hand, it appears to be so harsh. But on the other hand, there were so many protections and so many guardrails to make sure that someone could not falsely accuse, to make sure that someone could not rush to judgment and carry out this quote-unquote divine edict. No, when you understand the whole of the law, all of a sudden you're able to better see how the God of the Old Testament really didn't look a whole lot different than the Jesus of the New. <laughs> but the problem is, when you haven't taken the time to understand the law of the Old Testament, you're never going to see it. But Jesus came so you could see it. Because you might not get it in the full reading and in the full comprehension of the law. So therefore, He came personally so that you could see what God looks like. So you can see what God acts like. So you can see His mercy in action. So you can see His grace in action. So you can see His love in action. So you can see His empathy in action. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Oh, so you can see His compassion in action. It was in the Old Testament. You could have seen it if you looked at it and really looked at it and studied it. Jesus said to the scribes and Pharisees of his day, he said, search the scriptures, meaning the Old Testament canon. He said, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. What was the next statement he made? They are they which testify of me. <laughs> to know him, is to love him. 1 John 4, 7 through 19 today. This is my last scripture for the, the afternoon. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God. For God is love. Got news for you. All these politicians and all these people who are trying to find ways to write into law the ability to not treat people 
who are sick or who are wounded that they don't agree with whose lifestyle they don't agree with. Those people, my friend, are no more Christian than I'm a cement block. Amen. And the Word of God makes it abundantly clear. Said, He that loveth not knoweth not God. I didn't say it. John wrote it. For God is love. I didn't see Jesus discriminating against one single soul based on their lifestyle or their sin or their failings or their weaknesses or their faults. In this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, not unto the world, into the world. Just like you raise your children and you send them off into the world. You're not sending them to the planet, you're sending them out into the world. God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us. And his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he hath given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. As he is what? Love. So are we in this world. We are supposed to be shining examples of God's love in the world. Got news for you. God would never turn somebody away because he doesn't like what they do or how they do it or who they do it with. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Oh, I want to tell you, when you understand our God, when you understand that we see the Creator in the face of that one that we call the Son, then children, I want you to understand today, you have got an excuse in the universe for not loving Him. Because the only thing He has ever done toward you is show love. I don't care how anybody that calls themselves a follower of Christ 
I don't care how anybody that calls themselves a Christian has treated you. They're not God. And God has done nothing but show love for us. And I've got news for you. Everyone who has ever mistreated you, everyone who has ever abused you in the name of their religion, everyone who has ever acted ungodly or unrighteous and claimed to be doing it in the name of God, honey, let me tell you something. Don't you forget the promise of God's word. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. Don't you think those people... They may get away with it in this life, but they're not going to get away with it in eternity. They're going to pay the price for their choices. Mm -hmm. So in the meantime, I've been dirt, I've been done dirty, let me tell you, by people that call themselves Christians. Oh, oh I can tell you some stories. There's an old song the black church says, He ain't never done me nothing but good. Amen. Praise God. Oh, I've been mistreated. I've been abused. I've been cursed. I've been called every name under the sun by so-called spirit-filled so-called believers. But honey, the actions of the church of God have nothing to do with the God of the church. Because the God of the church is love. Jesus demonstrated the love of God. And to know him is to love him. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord.